All right, so here we go. Uh, I've switched to you know a seating position um, for this because I'll be typing some stuff in. It's just uh, it's just easier to do it from the desk than it is from uh, standing at a podium. And so what we're going to do today is just sort of continue the whole discussion, the whole idea of you know, what do you what do you do? How do you how do you go about the process then of figuring out what a star is made out of? And this idea, oh, we're going to use spectroscopy. We're going to look then at different transitions from electrons then uh, of different elements and different excitation states. And we're going to just think about, well, how much absorption then uh, do I see from this element with its electron in this ex excitation state uh, doing this transition? How much absorption do I see? Well, that's going to depend on the number of absorbers that I have. But it's also going to depend then on the properties of the gas in which those atoms and molecules are bouncing around, um, because the the properties then are going to determine you know how many of those atoms then are ionized, how many of those atoms then have electrons that are in the right excited state. And thinking about you know if it's a molecule, is it so hot that the molecules are being dissociated by the collisions in the gas? And thinking about then, all right, well maybe though for if I if I understand the temperatures and the pressures in this gas then and how they change with depth in the photosphere though, I can actually figure out then of these atoms and molecules and what fraction of them have electrons that are capable of making this transition that I'm observing then this 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 spectral line that I'm I'm observing and. Okay, well, uh, not only that, uh, maybe I also have to worry though about what the probability of the transition is too. So I have to worry about you know my quantum mechanics and my sort of atomic and molecular data. Um, you know, just because the the electron can absorb a photon going by, just because its energy might be exactly right for it to absorb uh, for the for the electron to absorb that photon there's a chance it may or may not happen and there's a probability of that transition. And sort of, you know, pull, pulling all that together, everything we talked about then with the idea of, you know, transition probabilities and statistical weights, basically the whole GF factor thing. Well, I say, all right, well, I know that too. And so for this particular atom of this particular element, um, at this temperature and at this gas pressure then, I know they're going to be, you know, this fraction then are going to be in the correct ionization state. And of that fraction that's in the correct ionization state, well, this, this fraction of that fraction is going to have their electron in the place that it needs to be to do this absorption. And I know the probability of that absorption. Well, gosh, if I know all of that, then I can look at the, look at the line from the star, how much absorption I'm seeing and say, well, if I know all that, how many absorbers do I need? How much of this element do I need in that photosphere to match the absorption that I'm seeing? And so that's the basic idea here. And, and we left off then on Monday talking about, you know, how to get then the properties of the atmosphere, namely the temperature and the, uh, the, uh, the pressure, things like that, then how to, how, to, how to start figuring this stuff out. So we can start thinking about, you know, what are the properties of the gas in the photosphere of the star? So we can take the absorption we see and use that then to get an abundance. And we, we considered then just as an example, um, HR 87, 99, which is also HD 218396. And I'm presuming from observational astronomy, you know what those letters mean. HR means it's an object, then it's a star that's in the bright star catalog then. And remember the bright star catalog then is this, this catalog of stars. I think of it then as stars that are effectively visible to the naked eye, that are stars that are about six magnitude then or brighter are in the, the bright star catalog. And so if a star name begins with HR and a number, that's its bright, bright, uh, bright star catalog uh, reference number. And of course, you know, HD as the Henry Draper catalog. We talked a little bit about this then, that old Harvard uh, objective prism survey from the, the very early 1900s, uh, the one that sort of started anti-jump cannon and the whole spectral classification scheme. Um, uh, basically, you know, it's that catalog, that huge objective prism survey uh, catalog of the sky then. And so this is the 218,396th entry then in the Henry Draper catalog. But it turns out it's a Lambda Boo star. It's got some planets going around it. 
It's got some uh, circumstellar disc uh, with dust, which is what you expect with a Lambda boot star. We talked on Monday, though, about, you know, we've been through the spectral classification thing. We can do this. We can look then at the spectrum of, uh, of the star and go, oh, if I'm looking at the hydrogen lines, it's an F0 star. Oh, if I'm looking at these sort of metallic lines here, you know, the, the hydrogen lines similar to the F0 star. If I'm looking at these metal lines, though, they're much more similar to an A5 star. If I look at the strength of the calcium 2K line, then the ionized calcium line, compared to its uh, neighboring hydrogen lines, and the strength of that line, oh, sorry, I'm looking at the, the actual target star here, the strength of that line far more consistent with what you'd expect in a hotter star, an A5 star, compared to an F0 star. So you look up the spectral classification of the star, you see F0, K, A5, M, A5, main sequence star. And, and so just sort of ballpark as a place to get going. Maybe you'll just look at the hydrogen line zone and say probably that's maybe the the better indicator of the temperature of the star because, yeah, I mean, it'd be... It, Maybe the disk is messing with the, the, the metal lines and stuff like that. I'm just going to say, all right, it's an F0 star. And I go to this table then um, that's also on as you learn then of effective temperature uh, for the different spectral types. And so you've got the spectral types here then and their corresponding effective temperatures. And notice, so it depends on whether or not you're looking at a giant, a dwarf, or a supergiant. So you go, okay, well, this star then is an F0 main sequence star. It's an F0 dwarf. So I might expect a temperature from this of about 7250 based on its spectral type 7250 kelvin then for the effective temperature of the atmosphere then that characteristic temperature then um of the star and again we talked about what effective temperature means and things like that meaning then you know if this star were a black body um, of the size of the star at the distance that the star is then um and i add up then all of the flux that i see at all of the wavelengths then um, I would get the equivalent amount of energy arriving at the Earth per square centimeter per second from this star as I would from a black body with a temperature of uh, 7250 Kelvin. That's the effective temperature. There are other ways, though, to get effective temperatures. You know from having taken photometry that you can get temperatures from color indices. We take a blue filter and a longer wavelength filter, I should say a short wavelength filter, a bluer filter, and a longer wavelength filter, and you compare the brightness of the star in the two filters. And if the star is more on the hotter end, then it'll be brighter in the shorter wavelength filter and fainter in the, the longer wavelength filter. If the star's on the cooler side, it'll be brighter in the longer wavelength filter and fainter in the cooler or sorry, fainter in the, uh, in the shorter wavelength filter. And of course, then you also remember, oh, wait a minute, these are magnitudes. So if you're looking at, well, let's just, you, let's just come right out and talk about the one that like lots of people use, B minus V, the brightness in the B filter compared to the brightness in the V filter. And this is sort of a blue filter. And V then is, is more designed to mimic the, the color response of the human eye. Then it's more sort of a green yellow kind of filter. But if a star is hot, then it's going to be brighter in the blue in the B filter than it is in the V filter. Oh, wait a minute. These are magnitudes then. So its magnitude in B is going to be smaller than its magnitude in V. Likewise, if the star is on the cool end, it's going to be brighter in the V filter and cooler in the, in, sorry, I keep saying cooler, less bright in the B filter. Again, with magnitudes then, B is going to be bigger because it's fainter in B, and its V magnitude then is going to be smaller because it's brighter in B, and oh, wait a minute, we're subtracting these two. So the smaller the B minus V color index is, the hotter the star is. Because again, thinking about its, its magnitudes, it's backwards. Um, and the same thing then, you can also go out and look at other, uh, <clears throat> other filter systems. A very, very good solid filter system then um, for getting temperatures is V minus K. And K then is an infrared filter. It's out at about, what, about two microns. Um, and you might ask yourself, well, why, why would V minus K be better than V minus V? And one of the ideas then is if you're thinking about, oh, I'm using these filters then to sample the flux curve of a star, a sample then what I'd expect with a black body curve then. Um, one way to think about it then is the bigger the separation between your filters, um, the more the, the the more curve you're sampling 
or thinking about then another way to look at it then is that K filters out there at the very, very long infrared wavelengths. And what you're, what you're really sort of getting a sense of then is sort of the slope of the Raleigh part of the, the black body flux distribution. Anyway, so it, it works better. It, the only tricky bit though, and it's a significant tricky bit, is that K filters in the infrared and our atmosphere is unpleasant to work with in the infrared um, if you've ever done it, just because of the issues with the, you know, water vapor is so absorbent in the infrared. Um, you really need to be careful calibrating your infrared photometry and thinking about then what's going on with your atmosphere when you do it. You can look this up though for stars. People have done this and for stars. And a place you can go to look for it then is the, um, Les, I can never say that word. Um, it's a photometric database then um, that basically has gone through in the, uh, in the literature then and collected um, basically a lot of the photometry then that's been out there for a lot of the stars. And so you can go to this database and let's see, so we're going to go ahead and do that. And I'm just going to punch out of here and I've dropped then into our uh, our sort of Linux machine here, our virtual Linux machine. I've gone ahead then and fired up um, good Lord, Firefox um, and I've gone then to the uh, to, to the photometric catalog then. And it's named after a university in Switzerland. I'm going to scroll down here then and the Web page then is part of the PowerPoint um, or. Uh, yeah, it's part of it. It's it's in the PowerPoint, um, or you can just Google it. It comes right up. Uh, form to query the general index. So you just click on that, and for stars, then um, you just enter the name of the star. You can see I've already done it, but you would just type in HD two one eight three nine six here and hit uh, query by star number. One thing about this though is uh, the stars are in here by HD number. If you give it an a, the HR number of the star. Um, it's going to be confused. So just give it the HD number of the star. It'll go off and think for a second. And there we go. And so this is all the data then that's available for HD 218396 in different photometric systems, which is fabulous. You've got your standard Johnson UBV. Um, you've got, I don't even know what UBV is. I don't even know what some of these are. Um, Vilnius then is a all sort of stronger like uh, a narrow band filter system, uh, the Geneva system, K-line measurements, all sorts of good stuff in here. Um, we're maybe interested in UBV though, just maybe just say, all right, well, what's the B minus V color of this star? And so you can just click on it. It goes off and thinks then, and it's got a couple of measurements then. I don't know why the references aren't coming up. But it's got a couple of, of measurements then of the, the V magnitude, the apparent magnitude of the star. It's B minus V color then, and then uh, U minus B, and gosh, what to say about that? Yeah, okay. Um, looking at the B minus V then, you're going to expect that's, that's pretty consistent with the temperatures that we're going to be talking about. Um, a negative or a, a, a zero B minus V would be about 10,000 Kelvin. Negative then would be hotter than that. Um, and so plus two, I mean, a really cool star, you'd be looking at B minus Vs. Uh, approaching two, so so this is this is more on the hotter side, but not hotter than 10,000 Kelvin, which is about what we're expecting, right? We're we're expecting then um, about 7,000 um, Kelvin or so for this star. And so what you can do, and what I'm actually doing right now, is just grabbing a little notepad and I'm writing down then the B minus V um, uh, the color color index then for the star. And I'm going to sort of average the two, and I'm going to call it 0.255. So the, the idea then is, well, how do I go from that um, into, uh, into an actual temperature? And, and what you have to do then basically is calibrate your B minus V colors from stars then to the temperatures of the stars. So you have to go out and figure out then the effective temperatures of a bunch of stars from other methods and then look at what their B minus V colors are and sort of work out then that relationship between the color index and, and the temperature of the star. And that's true for no matter what photometric system you're using. You've got to go out then and calibrate the relationship then between the color and the actual temperature of the star. Or somebody else has already done this, if you're lucky. And sure enough, yes, this is, of course, people have already done this then. 
Um, and really the best sort of the, I don't know, I hate to use prejudicial words like best, but but probably the best, um, sort of the, the gold standard then of how to do this then is by the infrared flux method then. And um, Blackwell, very, very famous for, for doing a lot of this, um, sort of, well, pioneering this in the 90s. Um, it's what we talked about where you go out and you have a star and you go and you measure them the brightness of a star at a whole in a whole bunch of different wavelengths and a whole bunch of different colors then over the biggest wavelength range possible. You want to have ultraviolet measurements. You want to have visual measurements. You want to have infrared measurements. And it's even better than if you can get spectra and the visible and the ultraviolet and the infrared and put them all together then and sample then the actual flux distribution from the star as a function of wavelength and put all that together then to say, all right, this is the total flux I'm receiving from this star as a function of wavelength. This is what it looks like. I'm going to integrate that and figure out then the total energy from the star arriving then here at the surface of the Earth and you know, just go, all right, well, what effective temperature do I need for a star of that size at that distance? You know, what effective temperature do I need to match the energy I'm receiving here at the Earth? It's what we've already talked about, and it's been done. Um, and uh, Cassegrande in uh, 2011, uh, or sorry, 2010, sort of updated this and, and the calibrations then that are associated with this. And, and there's a program then that's actually... Um, uh, if it's not on your uh, Linux machine, it will be soon because I'm sending you an update uh, to, to run then to put a, there are a couple files that didn't make it onto it then. So um, there's a program then that takes the B minus V index and, and produces an effective temperature based on based on the latest calibration. And so that's already in um, in your uh, in your. I don't want to say it. it will be then in your Linux machine. And the whole idea then is you can go and just run it, cast and grade B, BV then, and you go, all right, enter the B minus V of the star then. I'm going to go with my average 2.55. The other thing to worry about then, of course, is the metallicity of the star. And remember, Fe over H, it's sort of a proxy for the overall metallicity. What's going on here then is the higher the metallicity of the star, um, gosh, how to talk about it then, uh, the more opacity you have to, from, from electron scattering, among other things, the more absorption you have. This affects the distribution of flux in the star. And so if you think about it, a star of a given temperature, um, the lower the metallicity of the star, you know, you're just looking at a very specific temperature, you're not changing it. If you look at a star then that's low metallicity, it'll actually be bluer than a star then that's, that's higher metallicity. And this is all just an opacity effect. The higher the metallicity, think about it then the number, the higher the number then of atoms of heavier elements, heavier than helium then. And think about things like iron and nickel and titanium. And those have lots of lines, especially in sort of the, the bluer part of the spectrum then. You've also got a lot more free electrons because each of those heavy elements then is bringing a bunch of electrons to the party. You've got electron scattering going on. You've got H minus opacity to worry about. It isn't more stuff for astrophysics. But the, the net effect, though, is the lower the metallicity of the star, the bluer it's going to look at a given temperature. And so you need to correct for that then. And that's why this program is asking you then for the metallicity of the star. And I sort of know this ahead of time. It'll have a small effect. But you can typically think, oh, if it's a halo type star, um, I'm going to expect it to be down by about a factor of 100 from the sun. Um, if it's a disk star anywhere between a metallicity of zero, which is solarish, to maybe minus one. If it's a really old disk star, then uh, maybe it's only it's down by maybe about 10 percent the metallicity of the sun. I, and so this star for sort of an average, eh, I'm just going to go with uh, minus 0.5. And that's just because I know how this is going to work out, too. I do know the metallicity of the star. But so it's, it's a little bit depleted in heavy elements from the sun, but it's not crazy. Um, and so you just press the button, boom, and there's the uh, the effective temperature it thinks it's going to have then. And I'm gonna, just going to call this in. I'm just making a note. Um, this will be about um, 7228, which I'll probably just go ahead and round to 7230. 
All right, so that would be sort of the temperature of the star we're thinking about here, about 7230 then. Based on its B minus V color, it turns out the infrared flux method actually has been applied to this star, and that gives us about 7210 Kelvin for the star. So, all right, so we're sort of narrowing in then at about you know low 7200s from the, the star then, uh, just based then on the, uh, on the photometry. All right, so hopefully then that makes sense. So we've sort of nailed the temperature of the star down a little bit then to the, the lower 7,000 Kelvin range. Well, what else do we need to know then um, in order to do this? All right, well, we need to know the effective temperature of the star so we can calculate a model atmosphere so we can figure out then how temperature is running as a function of depth throughout the star. But we, oh wait, no, no, we also need to know about how the pressure is changing. We need to know the pressures in the atmosphere because that's going to affect then how tightly the, the atoms and the electrons are packed together and that's going to determine or that's going to affect then um, uh, my ionization balance. Uh, okay, so I need to worry then um, about the pressure or wait a minute though, we don't really talk about the pressure in stars and stellar atmospheres so much as we talk about the surface gravity. The higher the surface gravity, the higher the pressure, the more stuff is squeezed together. And we know though from the spectral classification that HD 8799 is a dwarf. And we know because we've done a lot of astronomy, um, dwarfs typically have um, surface gravities around 4.0 to 4.5 in the logarithm. And if, if I'm doing this in CGS units, and I think if you look at the sun, it's something like 4.44. Um, and so, yeah, something like that. Then, so we're pretty sure um, the surface gravity then of the star is going to be four ish. Um, but can we tune that any better? Um, and again, you know, you can do the spectroscopy thing and look at the ionization balance and things like that and get sort of a ballpark luminosity class. But that we're going to need to know then the surface gravity. Uh, better than that. And so we need to think about, well, gosh, can we, is there a better way to get the surface gravity? And it turns out there is. There's a photometric system. You, I don't know if you've heard about it or not, though, but it's called the Strongren photomet uh, uh, photometric system then. And it's basically a system then of four narrow pass filters in the blue. There's also a hydrogen wide and a hydrogen narrow filter then that sort of helps you measure the depth and width then um, of the hydrogen Balmer line, but we're not gonna we're not gonna be doing that here. Um, but, we're, but we're interested though in these four stronger and photometric systems. And there's it's traditionally then um, you talk about the Johnson BV UB or Johnson or Matthew UBV one. I'm doing it myself. Um, uh, U B V R I system. It, it's always given in capitals, like B minus V in the Johnson system. And that was capital B minus capital V or capital U minus capital B for the ultraviolet filter. So the Johnson filters then, and all, never mind the math, it's a variation on Johnson. Don't worry about it. Um, the, the Johnson sort of typical B, V, R, I, and U system then, it's all capital letters. The strong end system then is traditionally lowercase letters. So you've got a U, a V, a B, and a Y. And, and you can tell I always get sort of confused because in the Johnson system that you're used to then, it's what? It's U, B, V, right? And increasing wavelength. And the stronger end system, it's U, V, B in increasing wavelength. So basically the V and the B are flipped in the stronger end nomenclature, which drives me nuts. But nonetheless, um, these are the four filters right here, U, V, B, and Y. And these then are basically their effective wavelengths, 3491, 4111, 4662, and 5456 uh, angstroms. And so U, V, B, and Y. Um, and what's nice about them, though, is they actually, there actually is, um, I don't want to say it. There's a there's a color index then between these two between these filters then that actually is sensitive to the surface gravity in stars, and we can use that then to get a better handle on the surface gravity of this star. Um, but what we're going to do then, instead of working in magnitudes though, is we want to work to flux and work with fluxes instead of magnitudes. But we understand how to go from fluxes to magnitudes. We've been doing this so many times. Um, it's sort of like our uh, it should be secondhand. But here's basically the equation 
where the U, V, B, and Y, those are the magnitudes. And so the corresponding flux then is basically 10 to the minus uh, 0.4 uh, times that magnitude. You're used to that. You've seen that before. 10 to the power of minus 0.4 times the magnitude difference to the flux difference. And the number out in front here is just basically a, uh, uh, what do I want to say, uh, a calibration then to, to put it then on a standard uh, flux system then. And um, I'm not going to make you do this on a test or a homework then. Um, uh, there's a program that, that'll actually do this for you. But you should be aware then um, that you're actually going to be here comparing fluxes and not magnitudes. And of course, then these are fluxes. So the units are ergs per square centimeter per angstrom then for these fluxes. And again, there's a program then called mflux that does all of these conversions for us. And what it's going to do is we're going to type in then the actual magnitudes of the star then in the Strongren system. And we'll give that to mflux, and it's going to calculate then the fluxes. And then we'll also give it some model parameters and our sort of guess for the physical structure of this photosphere then in terms of its properties of temperature, surface gravity. Remember the squiggly thing with the T here then, that's the microturbulence and the, the sort of overall metallicity then of the star. And it's going to calculate then basically what the Stromgren fluxes are going to look like from a model with these properties. And you can then compare it um, to what we're, what we're getting then, um, actually seeing then from the star. So you're going to basically uh, toss some model, some parameters at it, temperature, surface gravity, stuff like that. It's going to say, oh, if this is the actual structure of the star's photosphere, in terms of pressure, temperature, yada, 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 this is what the Strongren fluxes will look like. And then you can compare it to the observed Strongren fluxes from the star, and you can fine tune a couple things like the surface gravity and just say, all right, well, this is probably then the surface gravity of the star. Um, that I'm interested in. And so that's the game we're going to play here. And so the idea, let's just go ahead and do it. Um, what I'm going to need then is to go back to my star. And so here it is uh, for HD 218396. This is, uh, this is the star we're interested then in. Um, so yes, HR 8799. And if I look, one of the other, oh, look, one of the other photometric systems it's got data for is UVBY. Hey, this is the Strongren system right here. And I can click on it and it's going to go. And these are all the Strongren measurements then of the star that we're the star then that we're uh, we're interested in, and so I'm going to go ahead then, and I'm going to just sort of make a note of this. And looking at this, I am probably going to be most happy with this set of measurements. And again, um, the beta and and beta, uh, the the beta then that is the uh, that's the hydrogen filter here. We're not we're not going to talk about that then. But we've got the V, we've got the B minus Y um, color from the Strongren system. There are two other colors in the Strongren system that are actually made from combinations of, of all the filters together, the M1 and the C1. Not going to get so much into that, um, but let me let me just show, sort of show you what's going on. And I'm most interested most most interested then in this is the sort of set, set of measurements I'm going to work with because this is based on 20 observations then of the star, these quantities, as opposed to this one up here that's just based on two observations. Um, here, this is just based on uh, uh, eight observations. And so I'm just going to go with this one here. And so I'm just going to, again, make a note and write down then the V magnitude 5.971. I'm going to write down B minus Y, 0 0.177. I'm going to write down M1, 0 0.146. And I'm going to write down C1 then, 0 0.683. And um, looking at them, though, I mean, they're not super different from each other. This one here is a little bit off. Um, but the others are all pretty much in line with this. So um, I'm pretty happy with that. All right. And so we go back to... Uh, we go back to our, uh, our our virtual Linux machine, and the program we want to run then is called mflux. Oh, what? Mm. Arr, hold on. Oop. Let me type a little better here. Did I install this? Uh, 
Uh, no. All right. So, oh, I haven't installed. Oh, I've built it, but I haven't installed it. This is one of the missing programs that I will have you add to your Linux machine. So here it is. Excellent. All right. So we're going to run mflux then, and it's asking me, enter the V, B minus Y, M1, and C1 colors for my star, 5.971, comma. And so there's a little bit of weirdness here then in that when you're entering uh, the photo photometry data then um, for mflux here, it's going to expect the numbers then, um, each number then to be separated by a comma and with no spaces. So you just type in each number, comma, no space, next number. So for V, it's 5.971. Uh, we've got 0 0.7 or 0 0.177 then for B minus Y. For M1, we've got 0 0.146. And for the last one then, C1, we've got 0 0.683. All right. Now it's going to ask me then for the corresponding temperature, uh, surface gravity, uh, 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 microturbulence, and overall metallicity then from the star. And it's going to say, well, if this was what's going, this is the actual properties of the photosphere. This is what the light's going to look like then. So we've got then a temperature. I'm just going to do average that up a little bit and round it. So I'm just, I'm just going to go with uh, 7230 for the temperature. I know it's a main sequence star, so I'll guess a uh, surface gravity log G of 4.0. For the microturbulence then, in general, microturbulences are inevitably somewhere around two kilometers per second, maybe getting up near three or down near one and a half, but on average then your typical star has a microturbulence set of two kilometers per second. And our metallicity we're already thinking is about minus 0.5. I'm gonna hit return and it goes off and woohoo! There we go. And so what it's plotted here is some stuff. Um, the, the sort of, I don't know what you'd want to call this, teal line here then is, <coughs> is what the flux from a star then with that temperature and that surface gravity and that microturbulence and that overall abundance. And this is what the spectrum then from that atmosphere then should look like. So with a temperature then of 7230, a surface gravity of four, a microturbulence of two, and an overall metallicity of minus 0.5, the, the teal line here then is what the spectrum should look like. The little blue dots here then that you can sort of see, well, these are located then at the centers then of the filters for the for the Strongren system then for the UBV uh, Y system, and the blue boxes then are if we take this model atmosphere then if we take this spectrum then that we calculated and we run it through the Strongren filters then this is the flux we would ex expect to see from the model then in those filters, and that's what the blue dots are. The red dots then are what's actually observed. And you can sort of tell by the uh, ambiguous key here, UBVY fluxes are in red and MUBVY fluxes are in blue. And the M there means model. And so looking at this then, oh gosh, our little blue boxes seem a little lower than our red boxes. And so uh, especially you know more here towards the blue, um, I'm not seeing as much flux out of my model as I am from the star. And so the model is sort of underperforming a little bit generally then um, in the flux, especially towards the blue. And what could possibly be causing that? And I mean, think about, think about the dials that you can turn here to change the properties of the light coming out of this atmosphere. Temperature, surface gravity, microturbulence, and metallicity. And you can say, well, maybe I could tweak the metallicity a little bit, but eh, odds are probably well, uh, either my temperature or my surface gravity is a little bit off. The microturbulence really won't have that much effect here. And so thinking about that, it's sort of generally just not as much light in the blue part of the spectrum then, oh, I bet my temperature is a little too low. And so thinking about, well, let's run a slightly higher temperature through here then. I say, all right, well, I'm going to, I don't really know what I'm doing yet, um, but I'm just going to make a guess here, make an educated guess. If it's not right, I can always adjust it. So to use this, then you just close the window 
So I press it on full close button. It comes back down here and it says, well, enter one to continue and zero to end. Well, I want to continue and I want to feed it then a new atmosphere. And so I'm going to maybe a little bit hotter then. Maybe I'll go with 7330. So I've heated the atmosphere up by 100 Kelvin. Um, my surface gravity is still four. My microturbulence is still two. My metallicity is still minus 1.5. And it's going to go off then. And oh, now, at least if I look in through here, um, the model flux and what I'm seeing is a lot more consistent. It's really just messed up here in the U filter. These others are, are really sort of good. All right, sorry about that. We had a little bit of an interruption, unplanned interruption there. Um, uh, oh yeah, okay, so we were talking though about, all right, we had just uh, increased our temperature a little bit. We were happy then because, uh, and we were matching these uh, these uh, sort of fluxes between the model and the filter. That's giving me a good bit of confidence that the temperature is right because this, you know, think about the, the slope of this part of the stars, you know, sort of here and here, the slope here. It's going to be a pretty good function of temperature. And, I, and I'm sort of matching that, again, going back to just the idea then of the black bodies. But what's distracting me, though, is what's happening here uh, sort of in the ultraviolet. And I do have a mismatch then between the model flux in blue and the stellar flux in red. I've got a mismatch here. We're in the ultraviolet then. I've got more light coming from the star um, than I do uh, than I do in my model. And so something still isn't quite right. And if I think about, you know, what this is all depending on, what sort of knobs do I have to, to turn to change things in this plot? Um, well, with the model, I've got temperature, surface gravity, microturbulence, and um, overall composition. And again, just looking at the slope of the, the continuum here, then uh, in, the, in the red, I'm pretty, pretty happy with that. I'm pretty sure I have my temperature right. And likewise, then, um, microturbulence is not going to affect this uh, in large, you know, to a large extent very much. It's not microturbulence. And you could say, well, you could, you could maybe tweak your metallicity. And that's true, but I'm pretty sure, um, you know, in order to, to make the star redder, I'd have to increase the uh, increase the metallicity of the star, and and that's, you know, this is that's pretty much the, the metallicity I'm sort of expecting for this star, and so I don't think that's it either. Well, the only thing left then is um, the idea of the surface gravity, and maybe what we're seeing here. Um, is something wrong with the surface gravity. And I'm never quite sure how much astronomy people have seen. Um, but if you look, you know, here's the hydrogen beta line, hydrogen gamma, hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. If you look at the spacing then, those lines are getting closer and closer together in wavelength as you move towards the blue. And remember, these are, these are hydrogen absorption lines in the visible. These are the, these are the Balmer lines. They're... Um, hydrogen atoms with electrons in the second energy level that are absorbing light and uh, and um, and jumping up and and what's what we're seeing here though is you know hydrogen alpha is over here it's not even being plotted but this would be a, a jump from two to three two to four two to five two to six two to seven two to eight two to eight, yada, 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 yada. um so what's going up here what's going on here then is why is there this big sort of what's going on here? Oh, wait a minute then. So right around here, maybe, oh, I don't know what, 3584 angstroms, 3586, somewhere in here, um, the wavelengths, the energies of the photons that we're talking about are actually blue enough, energetic enough, short enough wavelengths then to ionize the hydrogen if the electron's already starting in the second energy level. So we're seeing basically sort of a, an ionization wall here then anything, you know, the, the light sh wavelength shorter than this basically is going to end up ionizing the hydrogen. We talk about this then as a bound free transition for those electrons are starting bound in the second energy layer energy level and they're being kicked up then to be free electrons and um, in the soup that is the stellar photosphere. Uh, so this is an ionization thing. And we talk about it then as the uh, as the Balmer jump, where there's a huge jump in flux then um, from the star at, at this point. And it's a combination then, I mean, the huge jump is really sort of a combination between that and also you know, a change in the light that's emitted as a function of wavelength then. Um, 
you know, basically black, you're looking at a black body and where the black body peaks. And so you're seeing that as you're going to longer wavelengths and uh, a sharp decrease and also in the light that's emitted from the star. And it's sort of a double whammy um, in, a, in a star like this. Um, but OK, so th this is really just sort of an ionization thing that's going on here. And uh, when you look then at the, the Stromgren uh, system, then this is one of the things the Stromgren system measures. And if you look, it's got a filter here and a filter here a filter here and a filter here. You got these filters and you're sort of measuring then relative to this U filter. One of the things that tells you then uh, the Stromgren system then is sort of the size of the Balmer jump, which then does depend on temperature. Well, duh, it's an ionization thing, but it also though does depend on, on, um, on surface gravity. And in the case here, I mean, what we're seeing is we've got too many free electrons uh, going around in our going around in our model then. And what, what I need to do to reduce the number of free electrons in the gas, uh, to reduce the amount of absorption that I see in the ultraviolet, um, in order to get less absorption, in order to make the star brighter in the ultraviolet, I need to reduce the number of free electrons in the gas. What I need to do then is just crank up the gravity a little bit. And, and that will reduce the number of free electrons. And again, again you know, they'll be all squeezed in tighter so the ions won't live as long. And <clears throat> well, well, maybe let's do that and see if we can uh, change that um, to fix things. And so, all right, so I'm going to say, now nah, let's try again. Oh, hey, hey, go away. Uh, what? Oh, come on, what is going on? Oh, you're doing something weird, man. All right, I'm just going to control C and there we go. All right. So it's dead. Uh, hopefully you'll never have to do that. Um, worst case scenario um, is you can just close the terminal window and that should put it out of its misery. Um, let me try this again now. Uh, all right. So, oh gosh. All right. So I've got to remember then our photometry. Uh, 5.971, uh, 0 0.177, 0 0.146. And 0 0.683, excellent. And our temperature then, 7330. I'm gonna increase the gravity a little bit. I'm gonna try about 4.2. And for the amount of turbulence, 2.0. For the velocity, 0 0.5, we'll try that. And okay, it's, oh, dang nabbit. If I'm looking down here in the ultraviolet, um, I've actually overshot a little bit. Now I've got a little bit too much light coming out here in, in the ultraviolet from my model um, compared to, to what I'm seeing. And these are also a little bit off. I, all right, let me try a slightly different, um, slightly different gravity here. So 7330 and we've got 4.15. And the beauty of this is you can just keep trying different values until you're happy. And with that one, I actually pretty much am. If I'm looking at if I look at this end, I'm pretty much matching my U filter here. I'm matching the size of the Balmer jump. Um, my model and my observed flux are pretty much in agreement, sort of out and through here. Um, I'm actually pretty happy with this. I am going to call this then the model parameters then uh, for my star. And I don't know why it's reporting zero for those things. Um, and it also had another problem in there. Right? This is still a little twitchy. I'll, I'll work on it before I give it to you. Um, but the, the model then that I was happiest with then had a temperature then of 7330 Kelvin, a surface gravity of 4.15, microturbulence 2-ish, overall metallicity then of about, uh, of about minus 1.5. And so I'm pretty happy then um, with those values. So woohoo! Okay. Uh, let's see how we're doing on time. I got a couple more minutes. Um, all right, so that gives me at least some sort of a starting place then for the model for my star in order to figure out its abundances. There are though a couple of other things then um, that I also need to figure out. And I'm not sure, you probably didn't talk about this much in uh, in observational astronomy. I don't know. You probably didn't do a lot of spectroscopy, uh, if I know uh, if I know Dr. Caton. Um, but but this idea of all right, so I've got a star and I've got spectral lines, and I'm going to take them and I'm going to put them then through my spectrograph. 
And But wait a minute, though. Your spectrograph then has basically some sort of a, a, a limiting resolution. And, you know, as I, as I look at the lines in the spectrograph, I can talk about the width of the spectral lines, delta lambda. And I can talk about then the, the ratio then of the, the wavelength I'm looking at then to the width of my spectral lines, the spectral lines. And I can talk about that idea of resolution or the lower the resolution, then the wider my spectral lines are going to be, right? That's the whole idea behind resolution. And so I take the light from a star and I've got the spectral lines of the star and they are inevitably narrow. And I observe them then with my spectrograph. Maybe I'm at medium to low resolution, something like that. And that light then goes through my spectrograph and it has a certain resolution. And if the line that's going into the spectrograph is smaller in width than the width of my, than the resolution of my spectrograph, the, the width then that I get from the resolution of my spectrograph, what's going to happen? And if you think about this, you know, I'm putting a very narrow line into my spectrograph, though. My spectrograph has some natural resolution, some nat natural width, just because of the grading I'm using in the optics then. Well, that's the narrowest the spectral line can, uh, is basically going to come out of my, my, uh, my spectrograph uh, with that width that corresponds to the resolution. Yes, if the line I'm putting in is wider than my resolution, I'll be able to actually see the spectral line. And we talked about that in the spectrograph design, where you really want your resolution then um, to be two times higher than the resolution of the spectral lines, you know, the width of the spectral lines that you're interested in. And the, the idea, though, where I'm sort of trying to go with this, though, is that there's a there's a, a natural width that's imported or imported, imparted then to the spectra as they pass through the spectrograph and sort of a, a sort of an instrumental um, width that, that goes with it. And, and we have to worry about this. The fancy nerd sort of language for this then is the line spread function of the spectrograph. And so we have to worry about that because that's going to make the lines sort of wider, maybe wider than they really are. And we also have to worry about the idea of, you know, the star's rotation. Maybe the star has a nice narrow spectral lines and, but wait a minute, then the star is rotating. So some of the gas is moving towards me. Some of the gas is moving away from me. Those spectral lines then, because some of the absorption will be red shifted, some of the absorption will be blue shifted. That's also going to make the line look wider um, than actually what's coming off of the star. And so I need to worry about these things. I need to calibrate these things. I need to sort of figure them out. And so the next thing we need to do then is determine the line spread function of the spectrograph and the projected rotational velocity V sine I of the star. And so the first thing we're going to do then is try and figure out then the line spread function of the spectrograph. If I sped my spectrograph very, very narrow lines, what has some nat natural width to it then, because it's got a limited resolution then, what's the width of the lines then that pop out from that process? And there's, an, uh, there's a program then that's already on your computer, XEQW3, uh, that actually do does this then. And so the idea, though, is we want to look at some absorption lines um, that are narrow, but that maybe aren't affected by the rotation of the star. And what we want to end up looking at then, then are maybe telluric lines, which is a fancy way then of saying telluric, that means lines then that are imprinted in the light from the star due to the, the atoms and molecules in the Earth's atmosphere. And so these are Earth atmosphere absorption lines um, that are, you know, the light from the star has to go through our atmosphere. So not only we, do we see the absorption lines from the star, we also see the absorption lines from our atmosphere. And this is a lovely example then of, of telluric lines. And what you see here then, this is, and it's tough to see in here because it's got some telluric lines. This is an actual line from a star. And these little sharp, narrow lines here then are actual, actually lines then due to the Earth's atmosphere. And you can see then for the star how much wider the stellar lines are compared to the telluric lines. And so the telluric lines are very, very narrow. But when they pass through our spectrograph, though, they're still, they're still then, I don't want to say it then, um, spread out then to, to a certain um width 
And that's due to the resolution, to the finite resolution of our spectrograph. So we need to measure then the widths of these lines because this is the natural width then of, of the, the resolution then of our spectrograph. And I do see I am pretty much out of time. We will pick this up then on Monday. Hopefully this is making some sense. Um, and we should though by, hopefully by the end of Monday, uh, I'm hoping I'll be able to actually, you know, start measuring some abundances from some stars. And so hopefully this makes sense. If it doesn't, or if you have any questions, uh, come see me uh, during the office hours. All right, take care.